Part 1. You will hear a man called Ken talking on the phone to a friend called Liz about holiday accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello? Hi Liz, it's Ken here. Hi Ken, nice to hear from you. Are you... This is just a quick call. But Mary and I have just been talking about our summer holiday. We haven't booked a place yet, and we've left it a bit late. We were just wondering if you know of any holiday rentals in your area. It's so nice there. Well, yes. I can think of two or three places that are very nice. What dates have you got in mind? The 10th of July to the 22nd of July. Oh, yes. That is quite soon, isn't it? Well, there's a place near here called Moonfleet. Is that M O O N F L E E T? That's right. It's quite a rural location, and it's next to the owner's house, but it's got fields all around it, so it's very pretty. Hmm, sounds okay. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Well, it's an annex to the owner's house, and it's an apartment with two bedrooms, and an open-plan living area. Well, I like the sound of it. Is there anything we might not like about it? Well, it's quite a distance from the nearest shops, that's all. OK. And... Well, I'll tell Mary, but I don't think she'd mind that. Do you know how you book it? You have to book on the internet. There's a web address. It's www.summerhouses. One word? Yes. Then dot com. You'll be able to look at a photograph on that. OK. And what about the others? Where are they? The second one I'm thinking of is called Kingfisher, and that's even more rural. It's a really beautiful location, in fact. It's by the river, and it's got nice views. It overlooks woodland on the other side. Is that an apartment? No, it's a three-bedroomed house, and that's got a dining room, as well as a separate living room and a kitchen. But I expect it's more expensive. You'll have to check the prices. Hmm. It's probably a bit bigger than we need. But our nephew might be joining us. We're not sure yet. How do you book Kingfisher? You have to phone the owner directly. Shall I give you the number? I've got it here in my phone book. It's 01752 669 218. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And you mentioned a third place? Yes, there's a house that my sister stayed in last year. It's called Sunnybanks. Nice name. And the location of that one is rather different. It's in the centre of a village, but it's a very small and quaint place. Did your sister like it? Oh, yes. It's by the sea, so her children really loved it. What's the accommodation like? I'm not sure about the number of rooms, because I haven't been in it myself, but I think she said it's quite spacious, and I know it's got its own garden. It's not very big, but it's not shared with anyone else, and it's supposed to be very pretty. Any snags? Problems? The only other thing I can think of is that there's nowhere for parking. The streets are too narrow, so you have to leave your car somewhere else, and then walk to the house. It's only about ten minutes away, but... OK. 
Well, I don't think it matters personally. How do you book it? There's an agent you have to contact. I don't know his details, but I can ask my sister and let you know tomorrow. Thanks, Liz. That'd be great. I'll talk to Mary and see what she says. Thanks for your help. That's OK, Ken. I'll speak to you again tomorrow. I hope you find what you're looking for. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a salesman giving information to house owners about an alarm system. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Thank you for inviting me to your residence meeting. My name is Martin Pugh from Safe Cell Alarms. I'm going to explain a little bit about home security, and I hope you'll all feel a bit better informed, and perhaps that you will even purchase one of the alarms we sell. It is all too easy these days for people to break into our homes. Did you know that 25% of all burglaries are committed by burglars breaking and entering via the back door? Even though it is locked, it is still relatively easy for someone to gain entry. And there are parts of our house that we think are not vulnerable because they look inaccessible. But they're not. So, if you're trying to protect your home, you should make sure the top floor is covered by that protection, not just the ground floor. We believe that the only way to secure your property is by having an alarm fitted. Just having the alarm on the outside can put burglars off, and we also recommend that you warn them about the alarm. To do this, we suggest you stick a sign in the front window of the house so it can be seen clearly. This alone should be enough to dissuade a burglar before they start. Now, our company has a range of alarms on offer, and I brought several along for you to see tonight. But let me just explain a few things about them. First of all, all of our alarms are highly visible. They're colored red, and on the underneath, there is a blue light, which you can see whether they are switched on or not. This acts as a deterrent to burglars who can see it as an active alarm system. Like most systems, our alarms are very sensitive, so you do need to look after them. You may be surprised to hear that a cat can often slink around unnoticed under the infrared beams, but a spider crawling across them will set them off. Also, our system is a little different from some. Most companies offer an option that connects their alarms to the police station. All our alarms have an automatic link to our company office. This means we can deal with the situation promptly and can sort out any alarms that have gone off by mistake. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. OK, let me tell you about the installation of our alarms. Later on, I'll show you some house plans and diagrams of how the alarms operate. But you don't have to worry about them being intrusive, as we normally put them in hallways rather than individual rooms. The diagrams show you how the beams work to cover the whole house in this way. Oh, one small thing while I remember is don't leave your security code in your house. A lot of people keep it in the kitchen or their study, but we suggest you leave it with a neighbor so that if there is a break-in, the burglars can switch the system off. Now, regarding the practical aspects of installation, I know that many of you are out all day, and I'm afraid we don't install the alarms at weekends. But we do offer a service where we can fit the alarm system in the evenings for you. But we do charge a little bit extra for that. Finally, we do offer a range of systems, so I suggest you look at the leaflets on our prices. And please don't be put off from investing in a more sophisticated system to protect your home, as we do allow you to set up a monthly payment if it's too much in one go. Okay, now if you'd like to come forward. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. In the 8th century, the Chinese invented paper and woodblock printing. Remember that up to this time, very few people could read and write, and so only a very small number of people could understand written history. Suddenly, many books appeared, and many more people learnt to read. In the 14th century, the first printing press was invented in Germany. This reduced how long it took to produce books. The new printing technique quickly spread to other parts of the world. More books appeared, and even more people learnt to read. The first printed newspaper appeared in 1605 and the first daily newspaper in 1702. Now, people could read news stories soon after the event happened, and every event was recorded and stored. The problem with newspaper history is that newspaper reporters could tell the stories they wanted to tell, and not necessarily the truth. Photography was the next important development, we generally agree that photography was born in 1839. Some of the earliest photographs that the public saw were images of the American Civil War. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. People were shocked by the photographs of dead soldiers and for the first time saw the reality of war. By 1850, photographs appeared regularly in newspapers and people now expected the truth. At the end of the 19th century came the first motion picture camera. Soon, history was being recorded as moving images. In the 1930s, television brought moving images into people's homes. More and more people saw history as it happened, and more and more history was recorded. Today, of course, we expect that every event in the world is recorded. Satellite TV and the Internet allow people to watch any event, anywhere in the world, as it happens. It doesn't matter if the TV cameras are not there. People carry around mobile phones and can record any incident and then share it online. Families have their own video cameras and record their own history. Children now grow up watching their parents and grandparents on film. I'm sure you'll agree that the transition from storytelling to what we have today has been dramatic, and I hope that... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to listen to a lecture on language learning. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. This is the first in our series of lectures on language learning. The topic I'd like to deal with today is what makes a successful language learner? There's been a lot of research into what makes some people learn a language faster than others. In this lecture, I'll summarize the main findings of the research into the subject. There are many factors that influence how quickly one learns a foreign language, of which exposure to the target language seems to be one of the most important factors to consider. It's this factor which determines the speed of learning a language, especially among those people who learn a foreign language outside the classroom. There are more people who did not learn a second language or a third language in the classroom, and I think that understanding how learners successfully learn languages without the help of a teacher can provide us with the key to how to become a successful language learner. Let's look then at the characteristics of a successful language learner. Motivation seems to be one of the key factors. Research into motivation has identified two main types, instrumental motivation and integrative motivation. Instrumental motivation is the kind of motivation that encourages people to learn a language for practical reasons, such as getting a job or passing an examination. 
Learners with this kind of motivation intend to use the target language as a tool or instrument to help them achieve a goal. Integrative motivation is what encourages learners to learn a language in order to communicate and socialize with others who speak the language. The primary aim for learners with integrative motivation is to use the language to integrate and identify with the community that uses the language. Immigrants or people who are married to speakers of another language are motivated in this way. Although most people have mixed motivation, research into language learning and acquisition suggests that integrative motivation produces much better results. And is an important characteristic of successful language learners. Personality is another important factor in language learning. One does not need to be an extrovert to learn a foreign language, but willingness to experiment and take risks is essential. Introverted or anxious learners who are afraid of making mistakes find it harder to learn a language. Good language learners will try to experiment with different ways of learning vocabulary or grammar until they find the way that suits them best. Language is a complex system. Successful language learners often design complex learning systems to master a language. They think about how they learn and organize their learning accordingly. They develop their own learning style. And use a range of learning skills, such as efficient revision techniques, systems for learning and organizing vocabulary, the ability to monitor their own speech, and the ability to plan their learning. Finally, age is another major factor to be borne in mind. Children seem to be in the best position to learn a foreign language rapidly and with the best results. Older learners can also be very successful and become proficient at using a language. Adult learners who make decisions about their learning and are independent of the teacher, who are analytical and aware of how they learn, and who take responsibility for their learning, stand a very good chance of learning a foreign language successfully. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.